We're going to kick off our closing ceremonies. We're going to kick it off with a talk. And to intro that talk a little bit, it's important to remember that Ethereum, Ethereum is not just a technology, it's a community, it's a movement. And within those movements, within this community, we have values. And one of those values is the importance of civil liberties, civil rights, and protecting those. Uh, and for that, I would like to introduce Kurt Opsal from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel. So big round of applause to Kurt Opsal. <laughs> Let's give him a minute to hear this. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's so great to see so many people here today. Uh, I've had a great time here at DevCon, and I'm excited to talk at the closing ceremonies, talking about some of the value of cryptocurrencies in supporting human rights, these civil liberties, privacy, free expression, these rights that this whole community holds dear. Uh, a little bit... Uh, oop, there we go. Oop, back. Sorry about that. So a little bit about the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that has been around since 1990, fighting to preserve your rights online, fighting for free expression, for privacy, for innovation, trying to make a world that we would want to live in, to make sure that the dystopias that are possible won't happen. The sci-fi we read is not going to be necessarily the future unless it's the cool sci-fi with the utopias. All right, so let's talk about how we as a community can be supporting rights and liberty. There are a number of ways that cryptocurrencies can help support these rights. And I'm gonna just talk about a few of them today because we only have a few minutes. But decentralized financial options can allow and support political, social, moral views, can provide more options by taking away some of the centralized choke points which are often used as a point of failure, a point where control can be put onto a system and impose, uh, or Push, push back on unfavored or disfavored viewpoints, ideologies. So one of these, financial censorship. This is when a centralized financial service is under pressure from political regimes, from uh, social movements, to say that something that may be lawful, that may be uh, you know, within the bounds of what the law has said society can have, but it goes outside of their code of conduct or their review or just is subject to pressure and they forbid lawful activities. Another one which I know is very important to this community is the protection of privacy. And I think we'd rather explore that a little bit. What do we mean by protecting privacy? What is it doing? Privacy, of course, has its own value, but it's also fundamental for protecting other rights, other rights that we hold dear, like freedom of expression, freedom of association, and making sure that, that your information is protected by due process, that governments can't get access to the information without going through the appropriate steps, necessary and proportionate steps, to ensure that there's not government overreach. And another way that we can help doing this is enabling the decentralized web, moving away from chunk points, have other options that people can choose, enable competition, and allow it so that there's not a single point of failure that will enable people to choose things that reflect their values and allow for their values. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this, avoiding central financial censorship. One of the ways that this first came to my attention was 2010 with WikiLeaks, where WikiLeaks had engaged in uh, publishing some material about uh, the Iraq war that uh, upset a lot of people in the US government, and they put a lot of pressure on MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, the sources of donations for WikiLeaks, how are you allowing these funds to go to this or organization? This wasn't uh, a legal claim. They didn't pass a law to say that money could not go. They just effectively made it extraordinarily difficult for people to fund WikiLeaks. And one of the ways that WikiLeaks was able to get around that was by accepting Bitcoin, accepting cryptocurrency as a form of donation because it didn't go through those mechanisms. And this is an effective form of censorship, or can be an effective form of censorship, because these financial institutions are necessary for most people to be able to complete transactions. But it can have serious ramifications for free expression by taking away the funding that an organization needs in order to put its expression out there in the world. They rely, these organizations rely upon financial institutions in order to enable their sites. 
their operations. So th how does this affect people? This comes up in a number of ways, you know, membership in organizations. You often reflect your values by joining an organization. EFF is one, there's the ACLU, the NAACP, the NRA. There are many organizations around the world where people band together to reflect their values and they want to join, become members, and show their financial support. But if those organizations are cut off from the financial system, it can be harmful to the organizations and make it difficult for people to band together, use their right of association to express their, uh, the right of expression. Also, it's reflected in media that you purchase. That by supporting artists, uh, video artists, podcasters, book writers, who are giving you the information that one, you want to read, you have a right to read as part of your right of uh, free expression. And this is also essential for free expression so you can see the ideas, see the discourse, and participate it by consuming media. But if you can't get access to that because of a financial censorship, then that cuts you off and inhibits both the freedom of expression of the site that you're going to, the publisher, and your own freedom of expression by using your right to read and get these ideas and information. And it persists to this day. Uh, you know, I pointed out, uh, you know, saw this with WikiLeaks, but it continues to persist. Often it comes up in the context of erotic material, which is lawful but disfavored, and it gets cut off by some of the major uh, choke points in financial transactions. And these would be things that if under U.S. law and a lot of international principles of free expression, it would be unconstitutional to say these things are not allowed. They are, are constitutionally permitted to exist, but by putting pressure outside of the legislative system, outside of that process, they can cut off funding and make it more difficult for those things to survive. And the internet, if it's going to achieve its future as a global forum of expression, as a way for people to exchange ideas, we cannot deputize intermediaries to become the morality police and go outside of the legislative process, go outside of the policy process circumvent that and have a private entity become the morality police. Now, also, protecting privacy. And I just want to take a moment here. Why do we care about privacy? What is it doing to do and There's a number of ways of looking at it. There's a Louis Brandeis quote I put up here on the, on the slides that I think captures it very well. The right to be left alone. It's none of your business. It's my business. Just leave me alone and allow me to do my thing. That is a, a core autonomy aspect of the right to privacy. But it's also control over the flow of your information. That where you give information, you know, what consents have you given? Have you consented to give it to one person, but then they're going to give it to another? Where does that go? And having some ability to have, like, I want this information about me to be available to my friends, to my family. Another set of information I want to make available to colleagues. A third set to the public. But having some control over that flow of information can help bring about a, a, a way you can express yourself and keep the things you want private to be private. And also, privacy today, making your information confidential today, it's a protection against dystopian future. A future in which what was normal, what was okay, what was not something that you felt uh, endangered about for getting out there in, in the public today, the rules might change. A new government comes into power and what was previously no big deal now is a big deal. By maintaining your privacy today, you're providing a protection against a change in the environment where things that you thought were okay are no longer. And you know, this sort of one, uh, a former uh, board member of my organization once put this protection against the robots from the future. But we'll be able to look back, data mine all the information from your past activities, see what you were up to, and judge it by then the future standards, but if you have that information privacy protected, you yourself are protected. Also, as I was mentioning before, privacy is fundamental to lots of other rights. And we're looking in this case, financial transactions in particular, they can reveal deeply personal things. Like we said, this is the, this is the mirror image of the expression issue we hit before. So, Financial censorship was preventing organizational organizations from receiving the funds to have your membership. But also your transaction reveals something about you. It affects your private information by giving money to that organization. 
just as the, the supporting an organization or a media producer by, by purchasing their product helps them, it also reveals something about you, about your interests, uh, your, your ideas that you are consuming. Uh, your medical expenses can reveal a lot about your conditions that you might want to keep private. And we also live in an era where some medical uh, information can be disfavored. Some medical treatments are politically or socially disfavored and the information that you're using, your financial means to purchase these services can be used against you and used in a prosecution. Shopping history shows a lot of uh, what your interests are and often is used to make inferences about these interests. What you're going to do, what, what intent do you have? Now, anonymity can provide a lot of uh, protection. We are able to do things in an anonymous manner. It protects against the tyranny of the majority that allows for uh, views which are not a majority view, not a popular view, but you can have them and have protection from retribution for having these views by having anonymity or pseudonymity, allowing you to operate in the space without having to reveal critical information about your identity. So this comes up a little bit of a challenge, and one of the things I want to uh, focus on here uh, is when you have a public ledger. And the public ledger is a list of a lot of transactions. And yeah, they're going to, to a wallet. And if you never connect that wallet in any public way with your identity, that might be uh, a form of protection. But not everybody is able to do that. Most people will be using a service or at some point will use a service that ties their identity to their wallet. And if you ever do, your whole history of transactions becomes revealed. This is a, uh, a challenge. And then with that revelation, all your shopping history, your interests and such, also become revealed. And this is a, it's a challenging thing to have a situation in which you might be able to uh, use anonymity, but if you make a mistake, you could have a whole history revealed. You know, more sophisticated people can do things like have multiple wallets, use them for very purpose, but you still need to have a... Uh, high level of sophistication and accuracy to do it well. So one solution to this, which has come up a lot, Lisa, so I want to hit on it exactly, mixers. And in particular, Tornado Cash. The Tornado, I'm sure many of you are familiar, so I'll just go over very briefly what had happened. Back in August, the uh, Office of Financial Assets Control, OFAC, a part of the Department of Treasury, they placed Tornado Cash on the specially designated nationals list. And they, they put a number of wallet addresses and so on, but they also put you know, Tornado Cash by name on there, and they had a parenthetical, AKA Tornado Cash Classic, AKA Tornado Cash Nova, and this was on the list. And this struck everybody as kind of weird because this is a you know, piece of software. It is a, a smart contract on the blockchain. You know, there's also a DAO associated with it. There is the, you know, the open source project. But what do they really mean by Tornado Cash? Because this list is usually for entities. It can also be about property. If you look at the list, you'll see some like oligarch boats that are on there. But on the whole, it is designed and, and built up to be about entities, particular people, and they're listing Tornado Cash without any further definition. It was, it was vague, perhaps deliberately vague. Uh, so this led to some consequences. One of the most immediate consequences was that GitHub, which had hosted the canonical Tornado Cash repository, took it down. Uh, they also took down the accounts of three of the primary uh, developers. And this really uh, hit home for EFF because code being speech is one of the core things that we've been fighting for. We've been fighting for this since the, since the 90s, coming up in the encryption wars. Uh, and this was code being taken down uh, for, well, putting on a sanction list. Not even with a law about it, but just placed on this list. Perhaps even mistakenly. Perhaps they didn't mean the code itself. Though if you'll notice in the way they defined it, the AKAs are not easily confused, like Tornado Cash Nova was a beta that they had issued, it's not easily confused with an entity. Now, I, I tend to think that it's more likely that this was, they had no idea what they were doing, more than, you know, uh, malice, or at least 
malice in the sense that uh, they, they intended to take it down, but they still had no idea what they were doing. Secretary of State Blinken tweeted out right after the uh, OFAC listing, saying that they had gone after the, the North Koreans and, and taken them down, reflecting a very strong misunderstanding of what Tornado Cash was. That tweet was deleted very shortly thereafter, but it might be a clue into some of the confusion that they had. But nevertheless, it was on the list. So one of the things that we did was to uh, we represent Professor Matt Green. He's a cryptography professor at Johns Hopkins, uh, has been in, involved in uh, uh, Zcash and uh, zero knowledge proofs. And he also teaches about the blockchain. And he wanted to use Tornado Cash as part of his teaching. But he also wanted to put it back up there in part to show that you can put it up there, you do have a right to it. So we agreed to represent him in this. He made a fork, he put it up, back up, uh, and OFEC, well, didn't do anything about this. And this helped show people that the code could still be published. <laughs> Believe that both GitHub had the right to do it and Professor Green had the right to do it. GitHub is a private entity. As a private entity, you can choose what is on its platform, but they had the right to keep it up. And they had the right to keep up Professor Green's copy, which they have been doing. But there still are a number of unanswered questions. So why, why do we care about this? Well, I'm sure you all care about this, but I think it's good to say what are the principles behind the code of speech issue. So cryptocurrencies, blockchain, technologies, they're expressed in code. And you always were saying, this is part of a community, a community that has values. You are expressing those values in the code that you write. And code has both function and expression, but function is a part of its expression. When you're making something which is a privacy-enhancing technology, you're expressing this through the source code, saying how it works, that is a very clear expression. But also, having it be functional is part of what you're trying to express, and part of that speech. Uh, recognizing code of speech, as I was mentioning, we've been fighting this since the, the 1990s. Uh, it came up in the encryption context in the first instance, and in the uh, export control context. It was very similar to the sanction context. It was a program called Snuffle, open source encryption program. During that time, there were export controls because encryption was being treated like a munition. It was something that was a military technology, it was a dual-use technology, but as a dual-use technology, you had to get permission to export it. And there was a silly time period where Netscape Navigator, the prominent web browser of that day, had an international version and a domestic version, and the domestic version had much stronger encryption than the international version with the idea that now the NSA could more easily break the communications of the international version and uh, that, you know, make their job easier. It was ridiculous because it was trivial for someone to get a copy of the domestic version outside of the United States. It wasn't very effective, but also it was interfering with the free expression of you know, the cypherpunks who wanted to have a world which had lots of cryptography in it and expressed that by making freely available code. So we had some courts. The first case, Bernstein versus the United States, recognized that code was a kind of language. They likened it to uh, German, French, like you know, human languages, but also music as a form of a language. Music is in done in notation, it's much closer mathematically to code, and it is a way of expressing such, and established that the source code that was put up uh, by uh, Dan Bernstein was speech. Uh, later there was a case, Younger versus Daly, that it, Another point which I think is, is very critical, recognizing that the fact that it, of course, word is not just speech, it's not just a poem, but it is a functionality. It can be compiled and, and do things, and that does not preclude the constitutional protection. It's still speech. Now, to be clear, establishing that something is speech is not the end of the story. Uh, there, then, if it is speech, in the United States, the government has to pass a test if it is content-based regulation on it, it has to go through strict scrutiny, and there's intermediate scrutiny. And you can look at the functionality as part of that scrutiny when trying to determine, is the government doing 
you know, the minimum necessary in order to achieve their function. They don't have collateral damage. They are not going beyond their power. The higher level of scrutiny, the harder it is for the government to pass the test. But it still has to have that protection and the government has to show why this is the thing to do that is necessary to solve their problem and they are not hitting unintended consequences, collateral damage along the way. Now, these are United States courts, but I wanted to say this is not just a United States principle. So uh, a while back, uh, we did a white paper on the American Convention on Human Rights, which is an international treaty throughout Latin America. Uh, most countries are, are signatories to. It also enshrines freedom of expression in it. And we developed the argument, looking at cases, looking at precedent, that under the American Convention of Human Rights, code should also be considered speech. And I think this is, should be a universal understanding where you have free expression, which you have protected in many international human rights treaties, that we need to make sure that people understand that code is a form of that expression and should likewise be protected, whether you're coding in Latin America, in the United States, or anywhere around the world which respects human rights. So. Thank you. So the OFAC did have a response. They issued some frequently asked questions and answers. Uh, they did clarify that mere publishing of the source code was okay. So that was great. Professor Green was, was in the clear. Um, they said that uh, there's some dusting that occurred after they did the sanctions, and they said that was low priority. They didn't say, don't worry about it, but that it was a low priority prosecution. Uh, and they provided people with a way to apply for a license to get their money out of the, the mixer though you have to give up the reason you use the mixer, the privacy rights you're trying to protect in order to apply for this license. So it's not a really great solution that way. They also used this word saying it was okay to interact with the, the source code, but that's a pretty vague word. And the examples they were using, like teaching a class about it, publishing it, studying it, um, well, those are good examples, they're right, but or interact was too vague, and I would like to have OFAC clarify, or maybe we have to have the courts clarify, that things like contributing to the code is also okay. That publishing the code, publishing a compiled version, is also okay. Now, there's other questions that are open. Well, did they have jurisdiction to do this in the first place? As we were mentioning, it's super weird to have a piece of source code, a piece of software on an entity list. And the entity list is a power that is granted through, through the statutes. Is it, have they gone beyond that jurisdiction, beyond what they are lawfully allowed to sanction? So there have been a couple of legal challenges. Uh, Coinbase is funding a lawsuit brought by a number of people who are challenging the Treasury Department sanctions. They're asking for Tornado Cash to be removed from the sanction list. Uh, this week, Coin Center also filed a lawsuit. Uh, they're getting together also a bunch of plaintiffs and then themselves included, uh, again, to delist Tornado Cash. And they're raising a number of these issues. Some of their focal points are on the jurisdiction of OFAC to put software on this, whether they have exceeded their authority, whether they've acted arbitrarily and capriciously uh, outside of the scope of what their administrative authority is. Uh, and they also raise some of the code of speech issues. Uh, in the Coinbase lawsuit, it was talking about the ability to write the code, to develop the code, uh, and brought that at issue in one of their claims. And in the Coin Center, they're talking about receiving money anonymously as a nonprofit organization or member organization, the ability to allow people to fund them in an anonymous and private manner, the right of association, which is also under the First Amendment in the United States. So these cases will be, will be moving forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, we may uh, file an amicus brief to help support them. Uh, and I think you should continue to follow them. But uh, now, while we're pending, let's take a moment to think about why this all matters. Why do we care? And a lot of it is about open source. There's a lot of open source as part of what this community builds. And it is vital to be able to have lots of contributors adding to code. To be able to research, develop the code, make a pull request, modify it, find security holds, fix them. But if the contributors are going to be held responsible if later that software is used for something bad, they shouldn't be held responsible merely because they contributed code. That would have a chilling effect 
on the development of software that is vital to our future. And not only is this chilling effect going to be you know, bad for innovation, but even the very information that you know, the people who want to prevent money from going to uh, North Korea and ransomware might like to see. The innovation that might be able to improve upon the code so it can be providing the privacy that we need and allowing for a way of stopping money from going to ransomware. So privacy, as we said, it is a fundamental right. And take a moment to think not just about uh, Tornado Cash, mixers as a privacy protective tool, but all the other ones that are out there that could be used to protect the privacy of someone who's hiding from the law, but nevertheless are important for a free society. Encrypted messaging, encrypted communications, being able to encrypt your information when you store it online, anonymous browsing, anonymous servers, file transfers, all of these things rely on being able to you know, protect your rights by providing encryption, anonymity, technical protections, and they are vital for our society even if they could be misused. So we want to avoid that chilling effect. And I would say that I think that this is your rights to have and that the chilling effect should not dissuade you from writing the code, but we want to establish that. So hopefully in the courts or by OFAC relenting, but getting this clarified so we all know that we can go ahead and keep contributing to this code. Uh, and so to wrap up, I'm out of time here, but I'll hopefully some time for some questions. So saying together, we can make a brighter future. You can help chart this course. You can do it through getting informed and getting involved, talking to your representatives, getting involved in policy discussion, trying to get your views known and acted upon. And you can do it by building tools, by building civil liberties, privacy into those tools, making things safe, making them usable, making them so that they have privacy built in from day one. Make sure that they're decentralized, so there's not a single point of failure that the government can go after, can go to try and stop things. And together, we can make that brighter future. Thank you. Awesome, incredible. We do have time, we do have time for some questions. Uh, so we have a couple of runners in the audience. Who has questions? We have a couple minutes. I see one back there, one hand up, one hand up. Paraya, paraya. Uh, hi there. Um, Hello. I, I, I definitely uh, agree with um, all that you've said, um, except, like, then how does a criminal get ca caught um, if they're using, like, the internet for nefarious purposes? Like, um, uh, there's been some recent cases, uh, like, there's this documentary I saw on Netflix of, uh, like, a, a sex cult that was um, in South Korea and they only caught them because they were able to find the chat rooms, um, the secret chat rooms in Telegram um, that the cult leaders were using. Um, right, well, a good question, right? So how, how does the police able to do its job when we have all these technological protections? Well, I mean, my first response to that is we live in a golden age of surveillance. The law enforcement authorities have more ability to conduct surveillance at scale surveillance of uh, people like records about where you go. Your phone uh, is constantly talking to cell towers, giving your location. They can get that information, correlate it with some other person's phone and see who's traveling together and get an idea of relationships. Uh, the, the ways in which the government has investigative tools at their disposal are legion. And for going into a telegram chat room, well, traditional investigative measures, having someone undercover, pretending to be interested in that kind of thing, and getting into the chat room, that is the most often way in which they get inside encrypted chats. OPSEC is hard, and traditional investigative techniques continue to work. And what privacy-enhancing tools most protect you against is suspicionless surveillance, where they want to do it at scale, where they don't have a particular reason to go after you. If they do have a particular reason to go after you, there's other methods, like trying to get a uh, network intrusion tool or a NIT onto your phone and just look at the endpoint so it gets decrypted by your phone when you get that down there, and they look at it uh, at that point. And if like the NSA or the Mossad or the GRU is interested in you in particular, then probably a lot of these privacy-enhancing tools, you're going to have to up your OPSEC game a lot, and the tools alone won't do it. So, 
What I'm trying to protect against is suspicionless mass surveillance. The government has to have a reason and want to spend the resources to go after it and not doing it on millions of ordinary people. Right. Okay, hi. It's me, it's Alex here. So first, thanks for your work, and I definitely agree with everything you said. Thank you. I was just wondering about a f something you didn't say, right? I missed seeing a name being talked on the tornado cache, and that's, of course, it's Alex Bertsev case. And yeah. I wonder, what are any purpose? Are, are you, did you, do you, do you want to say something about the case or about him or about, like... So, yeah, you're talking about the case in, in the Netherlands. Yes. So one of the challenging things about the case in the Netherlands is that he was arrested, but not yet charged. So he's been held and he went to a hearing and asked, well, like, hey, am I free to go? And they said no, but he still hasn't been charged. And I'd like to see what the charges are that they're trying to bring before analyzing that situation. Because what I don't want to see is that he's been charged merely for contributing to the code. But I also don't want to speculate as to what they might have against him. That, you know, it is the government's job to say why someone is in jail, why someone has been charged, and bring it. And then we can look at what they say and say why that is wrong, why, you know, what the defenses are. So I try not to speculate on things that are, are not charged, but that is not to say I'm not sympathetic for a situation. I'm not a Netherlands lawyer, so I, I don't know the Netherlands law uh, particularly well. But I think as a policy matter, it is unconscionable to arrest somebody criminally, one, and not charge them, and let, let them know what the charges they can build a defense, but also to create this chilling effect implication that because he contributed to some code, that that's why he was charged. And I wish they wouldn't have done that. Okay, t today most, all right, we have time for one more question. One more question. Yeah. Great, I'm on. Hi, Kurt. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing you at the Zcash convention in Las Vegas a few months ago, and now you're here, so you're really making the rounds. I'm excited about that. Uh, Thank my you. question is, with all of the ZK technology, the privacy-protecting technology and Zcash, Ethereum, the competitions that are happening, what... What's your general thoughts on that? And also, is there anything that's missing from a lot of the maybe philosophy or values perspective when they're building this? So, uh, the, good, good, good questions. One is that, like, I think uh, zero-knowledge technologies are extraordinarily interesting. And the way of being able to prove just one thing without sending extraneous data, I think I, I've heard, like, while being here, talk to various people, and ideas that are underway or being researched, that if they come to fruition, will be able to allow for a number of things that don't have this leakage of metadata around them that we often see. So I'm very excited about the possibilities of these technologies. The other part is what more could be done. And I, I think one of the things that is going to make all of these kinds of technologies you know, on, on the blockchain generally, smart contracts, especially privacy enhancing ones, to have the most value, they must be able to be used by a wide range of people. People who are not technically sophisticated, who might not have the latest versions of software, who are operating on a five-year-old smartphone that doesn't get updated all the time, and still they can make a secure transaction, they can do something in a manner that they feel comfortable knowing what they're doing, that they're not going to make a mistake and, you know, lose what they're trying to do. So usability, security, keep it secret, keep it safe. And I think that would be, I mean, people are all working on that, but I, that's the area I want to be able to have it so that everyone can take advantage of it in an easy to understand and easy to use correctly way. All right. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Amazing. Let's give, let's, let's give a big round of applause for Kurt from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you. Incredible. Great to be Incredible. here. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you, Scott. Very nice, very nice. Amazing.